Happy Friday morning from the Asia Pacific. It's 9 a.m. in Beijing, Shanghai, and here in Hong Kong. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets China Open. I'm David Inglis. And I'm Yvonne Man. We are counting down to the open of trade in the Chinese mainland and Hong Kong. Our top story, stocks pause and bond yields tumble after a shock policy hold from the BOE curbs global rate hike bets. OPEC Plus ignores U.S. demands for more oil, blaming higher coal and gas prices for the world's energy crisis. And President Xi says China is open to talks on state subsidies to industrial firms, a key tension with the U.S. And Dave, we will focus a little bit more on those geopolitical tensions. Are things seeing a bit of a thaw between U.S. and China? Mm. That's the key question. But front and center this morning in China is Kaisa. The stock has been suspended after they didn't miss this payment on these wealth management products. Yep, unprecedented stress on liquidity is how the company phrased uh, the issues, uh, you know, you look at some of the bonds, for example, one is actually trading now below 50 cents on the dollar. We'll see what that happens, you know, what that does with high yield. We're also looking ahead, obviously, to the jobs report out of the U.S., really capping what's really been quite an eventful week uh, for central banks here. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's Friday. Have a look at where we are here market-wise. We're just take a wide shot, please, and have a look at U.S. futures. Also, our approach to the open uh, of your markets here. So we're coming off and we're losing a little bit of steam, obviously, some momentum coming into Friday morning uh, in the Asia-Pacific. Now, that being said, have a look at futures, Singapore uh, and traded here in Hong Kong, your A50 and also your uh, your MSCI A52, of course, here, here in Hong Kong. Uh, dollar China, as you can see, a little bit of weakness in the U.S. dollar. We're still watching coal. There's an update here on this out of the NDRC. This is quite important in case you missed it, uh, that the economic planner is now basically saying that uh, inventories of coal at power plants in China are back to uh, normal levels. Can we put this story behind? Let's see what happens with these markets a bit later on. Uh, flip the boards, please. Have a look at commodities. Obviously, you had uh, the oil story and OPEC Plus sticking to its guns in that commitment as expected, 400,000. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of upside giving, uh, reversing higher some of that weakness that we had yesterday. Uh, and just very quickly here, rates and FX. And of course, Ivana, uh, we were pointing out earlier, you know, the, the, the bears were on loose on the short end until central banks happened this week. RBA Fed and, of course, the Bank of England. And, uh, in fact, on that very point, we did hear from the Bank of England, Governor Andrew Bailey, who told us that he was puzzled, essentially, by the market view and interest rates, adding that the job market is not really where it wants it to be. Have a look. Market pricing, you know, I think... You know, as you could tell from the commentary we made uh, you know, today, right direction, some bit overdone, but in my view, if you want a candid view. All right, so that was overnight. And Yvonne, we're looking ahead to some key data today. I mean, we should be getting, I believe, trade numbers out of the Philippines, the GDP numbers out of Indonesia, but of course, it's the jobs report out of the U.S. Yeah, and you got to wonder, right, Andrew Bailey, is he kind of the the, the bad boyfriend again, right? Uh, we saw with Mark Carney and this unreliable boyfriend once again, that theme. But the, today, when it comes to bond markets, it really is getting to something that is we're seeing with, with the RBA this week, uh, the Fed and the BOE, is that they are aggressively trying to fight back what the market pricing has been when it comes to rate hikes. Uh, and the jobs report is going to be very interesting as well. Is this the next event risk for bond markets here? 450,000 is the concern consensus right now. Can we see a reversal of those two disappointing prints that we've seen out of the U.S.? So Friday, today, that jobs report is going to be pretty crucial as well. Let's get back to uh, what we've been seeing here in China and the latest with Kaiser Group right now. And yeah, suspending trade when it comes to the stock and its units. Let's get more from our chief China markets correspondent, Sofia Horti Costa. She's here with us in our studio. And Sofia, do we know why we, we saw this suspension? Uh, we don't know why. Uh, no reason was given um, in the uh, statement uh, that we just got from the Hong Kong exchange, we know the bonds will continue trading. So let's look for the market reaction there. Uh, this is a company that yesterday said was facing unprecedented liquidity pressure. It missed payments on wealth man management products. Um, and that's about $2 billion worth uh, of uh, outstanding products that it has. Um, and it was scheduled to meet with the Shenzhen local government today, although that was reported by Kalyan, which has since retracted that report. So we're, we're looking to see what happened there. Um, and this is, you know, even though it's a smaller developer versus Evergrande, say, and it doesn't have the size of the liabilities uh, that Evergrande has, Kaisa is a huge 
uh, issuer of dollar debt. It has um, one bond due in December, it has coupons to pay and it's also scheduled to pay a dividend uh, to shareholders in December. We'll see uh, whether it goes ahead with that, can still cancel that and that's uh, meant to cost the company about 200 million um, Hong Kong dollars. So. Again, you know, this really il illustrates the stress uh, that's happening in China's credit market where junk bond yields are above 21% um, and Kaisa could really be the next domino to fall. It's a pretty big uh, domino. All right, Sophia Horte Costa there. Thank you, our chief China markets correspondent uh, joining us in Hong Kong with the latest. We'll see how this all plays out when the property stocks, uh, once they start uh, trading here later on this morning. Uh, let's talk more about, uh, bring it back to markets and Manfred Gill, head of FICC investment strategy at Standard Charter Private Bank. Uh, uh, Manfrey, I'll bring it back to what we've been seeing global uh, bond markets in general when it comes to the week that we had, starting with the RBA. Uh, I guess you could argue that the Fed and the BOE were, were less dovish than what we heard from Phil Lowe, but what have we learned this week? Well, I think the biggest takeaway is that, uh, you know, outside of, uh, you know, the direction of policy, trying to sort of judge, you know, where market expectations are and whether they've run too far. I think that's an equally important decision. And I think with the Bank of England in particular, that's the key takeaway. Uh, you know, where we, of course, do expect rates to go higher and the pound sterling, for example, were bullish on a six to 12 month basis. Uh, but in the short term, we had actually expected a pullback uh, because we thought expectations had gone too far. And, and, and we're seeing sort of exactly that play out. And I think that's the lens through which we'd see a lot of the central bank decisions, particularly the Fed, uh, where markets, of course, looking for about two rate hikes now next year. Uh, again, and we think uh, look, nine months is a long time away, but I think we need to always judge against you know, whether that's about right or whether that might be running too far. And the employment data, of course, uh, will be the key one here. Uh, so it's about balancing both factors. We think the direction, of course, is still towards the, uh, you know, less accommodative policy. Uh, we just need to be realistic about how quickly that might happen uh, because we think inflation uh, does have room to come back a little bit from where it is today. So... Why do we then keep thinking, Manpreet, that yields will keep going higher? I mean, the argument for higher inflation and, uh, and whatever that's causing it could have been made several times over the last few months. And then people keep telling us it's 1.7 to 2. I think that's your forecast. With all due respect, why do we keep thinking it's going to go that way when it hasn't? Well, I think that the long-term yields is about pulling a few factors together. I think one, of course, is the rate hikes and when they kick off. But I think where longer right. yield sort of forecasts become a lot harder is you're trying to judge, okay, where does that rate cycle end uh, and where does economic growth look alongside of that? Uh, you know, and how far are policymakers willing to push uh, on the net of inflation or real yield sort of side? So, look, I think a 175, two percent is uh, you know a range which is consistent with you know growth eventually returning to trend uh, about you know. Uh, you know, a few sort of rate hikes, mainly occurring through, we think, 23 and 24. Uh, but the reality right. is, look, these are expectations we're going to write just as we go along, because inflation here is key. I mean, we do think expect it to sort of expect inflation to pull back uh, because we think a lot of it is, you know, from the supply chain driven aspect as opposed to demand driven. But I think the housing component in particular is one watching closely in the U.S. to see how far that argument, uh, you know, does sort of uh, spill over into more demand led inflation. Uh, so I think that's that's the key for us. But uh, for investors, you know, it's about sort of still uh, the big takeaways avoiding excessively rate sensitive bond, bond markets. And that's where picks for EM high yield come through rather than trying to time a specific top in top in bond yields. So w where do you focus on the yield curve then? Should I assume that, you know, rates volatility in the short end is just going to continue? Uh, look, that's reasonable. I think uh, what is a reasonable expectation is to go back through cycles and say, okay, what did sort of happen to bond yields short and long uh, when sort of previous sort of tightening episodes, kick, tightening cycles kicked off? And, and I think where that leaves us is to say, look, chances are we'll see bond yields move higher across the board. But generally speaking, investors have been better served historically by uh, keeping maturity profiles a little bit on the shorter side, uh, but also focusing on credit where possible. Um, I, I think that's sort of where we've seen uh, most of the performance come through. So high yield, for example, tends to be much more sense to what the credit spreads do, that growth remains well supported. I think there are much bigger challenges when you're looking at government or investment grade related bonds where, look, safety, absolutely. And I think that's, that's clearly been the strength. But in investment grade credit, for example, there's not a lot of buffer when you're thinking about absolute returns uh, in an environment where yields are, are creeping higher across the board. And uh, Manfred, your call there, your, your bullish call on high yield, would that include, you probably know where I'm going with this, would that include Chinese high yield dollar debt? 
It, it, it does. Uh, and I qualify that Asian mm. high yield more mm. broadly speaking. Uh, but the argument's clearly mm. very different to what we're talking about in US and Europe, which is much more about growth and, and where policy rates are going. Uh, I, I right. think Chinese and, and Asian high yield is in a completely different point in the cycle. Uh, and the lesson, what's interesting here is that the good comparison is when you look at what US high yield did when it was going through recessionary periods in the cycle, when you saw spreads blow out quite like what Chinese and Asian high yield has done. And I think that the two sort of key lessons here, uh, one is no doubt the short term journey, it's never an easy one. We've gotten used to, you know, very short sell of cycles, but recessionary cycles, you know, can be can take time to work through. And I think what's key here is that policy, uh, you know, uh, you know, begins to turn at least a little bit less restrictive. Uh, but second is that when you start taking six to 12 month outlooks, uh, then actually total returns from these levels tend to look very, very attractive. It does mean avoiding, of course, some of the lower quality parts of high yield. Uh, but you know, it's about balancing the two factors, a tough to short term journey, but what usually ends up being quite interesting uh, returns from a 12-month point of view. Man, great. Uh, we'll have more of a man for Gill there from Standard Chartered Private Bank. He's staying with us. In the meantime, let's get you caught up with the first word news. We have Vani Quinn in New York. Hey, Vani. Hey, Yvonne. Thank you and good morning. President Xi Jinping says China is open to discussing key points of its trade tensions with the United States, including subsidies to industrial firms and state-owned companies. He says China will take a, quote, active and open attitude to talks on issues such as the digital economy, trade and the environment. She spoke at the opening of the China International Import Expo in Shanghai, where he also mentioned policies aimed at boosting imports. The White House says OPEC and its allies are putting the global economy at risk after the cartel rejected President Biden's pleas to hike production by more than planned. OPEC Plus stuck to its original plan to raise supply by 400,000 barrels a day in December, setting pressure on oil demand from the coronavirus. The U.S. had asked for a hike of at least double that to alleviate high crude prices. The Biden administration has mandated COVID vaccines for all staff at U.S. companies with 100 or more employees. Under the federal rule, workers must be fully vaccinated by January 4th or submit to weekly testing. Employers that don't enforce the rule or deliberately ignore it face fines. About 80% of U.S. adults have received at least one vaccine shot. A London court has allowed Malaysia to continue its pursuit against Abu Dhabi's sovereign wealth fund for its role in the multi-billion dollar 1MDB scandal. Malaysia's government challenged a 2017 arbitration settlement between the two sides in the UK. The London case is one of a series of legal and regulatory investigations around the world linked to 1MDB. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Vonnie Quinn. This is Bloomberg. Yvonne. Well, still ahead, as the rest of the world opens up, can China hold on to its COVID-0 approach for much longer? We're going to ask Christina Ramirez, professor of biostatistics at UCLA. Also coming up, the sell-off in Chinese property dollar bonds intensifies as cracks start to emerge in the onshore space. We'll get you that story later this hour. Also counting down, of course, the Friday sessions, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and here in Hong Kong. This is Bloomberg Markets, China Open. Good morning. to show comparing us as OPEC plus not as what uh, some of you unfortunately call us as a cartel but as a responsive regulator to a market that needs to be regulated the Saudi energy minister there uh, on the back of that OPEC meeting uh, mm. designed to stay the course here. And the Biden administration is saying that OPEC plus is putting the world's economic recovery at risk by failing to put more oil back into the market. And that's after the cartel stuck to that plan, as we talked about, raising production by 400,000 barrels a day next month instead of doubling what and the, the U.S. was calling for. Yeah, let's get a little bit more detail on what that decision was was like. Sharon Cho, our oil market reporter, has more. Sharon, was that a statement, uh, was that a political statement or a statement of economic reality from OPEC Plus? Um, no, I think um, OPEC, you know, decided to um, stick to their earlier pledge to boost 400,000 barrels a day. Mm. Um, it remains a, as a question whether it's like um, them realizing the economic reality 
but they did ignore the calls from big consumers, especially the U.S., who have been asking for a larger output gain. And, you know, U.S. said yesterday that they were looking for OPEC Plus to ramp up by 600,000 to 800,000 barrels a day, and that, that totally fell short. And during the conference, um, OPEC Plus did point out that the price increases of oil um, compared to the likes of gas is much lower and that the Brent crude has been doing well compared to the rest of the energy complex. All right, Sharon Cho, thank you there on a wrap-up of what happened at OPEC. Our oil markets reporter joining us from Singapore. Mm. For more, let's bring back uh, Citigroup's global head of – no, we're going to talk a bit more to Ed, Ed Morris. <laughs> Citigroup's global uh, head of uh, commodities research there. That interview mm. coming up the top of the next hour. And it's Manpreet Grill, yeah. who is still with us, <laughs> head of FICC Investment Strategy at Standard Chartered Private Bank. Manpreet, how are you, sir? Thanks for sticking around. Let's stay in commodities. You like gold, all things equal. Why? Well, I think gold, there are two factors uh, here. I think one is um, we think it's a good allocation to have in a portfolio. We're not super bullish uh, in terms of our price expectations, but markets clearly worry about inflation. Um, and while we hope to make most of our returns from equities uh, and to a lesser extent high yield bonds, I think gold can definitely help smooth the journey uh, as you know we inevitably have a few inflation scares along the way. I mean, just a point you made on, on oil, for example. Uh, so I think that's one role it plays. Uh, and second is, look, the, there is a risk. We think a small one, but there is a risk that we're wrong about inflation and it still lasts longer or ends up higher than what we expect. And I think that's the scenario in which, you know, riskier assets might hurt a little bit, but gold can definitely provide a buffer. So in our view, those are the two key drivers. It's it's not the asset class where we hope to make our biggest outsized returns, but it definitely offers some some good hedges against, you know, the, the what we view as risk scenarios, uh, particularly from an inflation perspective. So that's the role we think gold plays uh, in investment allocations today. I, I want to bring it back to oil, though. Do you think OPEC made the right decision, or should they have actually raised output? Well, that's a tough one, and, and, and to an extent, of course, OPEC uh, you know, members would know that better. But I think it's a tough tightrope. Uh, it, it's a lot like the inflation debate. It's about trying to look through some of the short-term stresses versus comparing what demand and supply might look on a 6- to 12-month horizon. I think the challenge in the short term is that we've got a number of stresses. Uh, we can see demand, for example, in some cases, uh, particularly driven by the U.S. for many commodities around the world um, at the manufactured end, uh, is higher than usual. Uh, and we've seen some supply stresses elsewhere in the energy complex, I mean, natural gas in Europe being the obvious one. Now, these are not perfect substitutes. Oil cannot be a perfect substitute, but there are some spillover effects. So it's understandable to some extent to say, how, how does an OPEC member sort of look through those while trying to balance, you know, what 12-month demand and supply could look like? And look, we're constructive. I think on a 12-month basis, we think demand is really the key factor. And we see this economic mm. recovery continue to extend. You know, we think oil can stay in the region of the, of the $80. Uh, I think the challenge is sort of getting through some of the short-term volatility. Um, but from an economic growth concern, I'd argue it's less of a uh, you know, problem than that's it has been historically, uh, as the share of oil consumption, of course, keeps getting smaller as a share of the basket. So, uh, you know, a bit of a tug of war, um, but, you know, something we think on a 6 to 12-month horizon, uh, you know, should keep oil prices about where they are, maybe a little bit higher. And, and, and Manpreet, what about oil proxies in FX and equities? Because in equities, that's your best performing sector. In FX, you know, Krona, Looney, what have you, have really done very well. What do, what do I do about those? Well, I'd argue that uh, some of the FX proxies might be a little bit better. Uh, if if that's the trade sort okay. of someone's trying to get exposure to, because uh, it, it does sort of it line up with what the central banks are doing in the Bank of Canada, for example. So a little bit more consistency mm -hmm. and slightly cleaner exposure. I, I think the challenge often comes through with, with the equity exposure uh, in commodities, because it's not just the commodity price correlation, but having to worry about the equity price correlation, uh, you know, the cost of inputs, uh, which impacts margins. So we've seen that with gold miners historically, for example, where eventually the correlation is there, but you can see, you know, significant divergences in the short term. So for for us, if it's about commodities, uh, whether it's oil or gold, uh, you know, direct exposure where that's feasible, of course, is, is ideal. But you know, we think FX uh, can sometimes be a better exposure than just the equity side, uh, unless all the drivers are really coming together in a positive sense.
All right, um, thank you, Gil. Have a great weekend. Standard Charter Private Bank, head of FICC Investment Strategy. Just want to break these lines crossing from the PBOC right now. That yuan fix uh, now uh, at 639.80 against the dollar. That is just slightly stronger, but pretty much in line with estimates here today. Yeah, they're also getting an injection, daily injection today, boosting it. In fact, I think we were at 50 yesterday. I could yeah. be mistaken. It's 100 billion for today. So that's at least the PBOC News and the full market roundup. And of course, the agenda. There's plenty ahead, of course. Plenty of sectors to talk about. That's just ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the show. It's Flashback Friday. We're talking about Kaiser. <laughs> back yeah. to 2015. Back to 2015. Well, they're suspended today. Yeah. I'm mm. um, not sure why. Mm. Uh, they weren't really clear when it came to that statement today. But, uh, of course, we did know that they talked about unprecedented liquidity issues as yep. well. They also failed to pay these wealth management products uh, to their uh, investors. So that's going to be the key focus today. Absolutely. And take a look at the property sector. Yep. How is it going to play out these contagion effects once again? Now the onus is back to this one company, which is Kaiza, which is interesting because this was a company that actually complied with China's three red lines. Uh, Shuli Ren did talk about how maybe this means these metrics are perhaps rubbish at this point, our Bloomberg opinion columnist there. Uh, but we're seeing Evergrande just see a 1% gain, not much reaction in the pre-market and some of these property stocks, but the bonds have continued to tumble yesterday. We'll see how that plays out here today. Other things that we're looking out for, whether it's the, the, the tech plays, given where yields are this morning. Uh, also, when it comes to Lenovo, we just get that note from Citi talking about how the earnings boost could really help the stock a bit here. Uh, but we're taking a look at C Look, that's an oil play as well. We're lower by about one and a half percent. Lenovo, not much reaction, but they already did see some upside to uh, er, beating expectations there yesterday when they reported earnings in the afternoon. And we're looking at the likes of Heidi Lau. This is kind of one of those COVID related stocks in China, hot pot. One point, one, about 30 percent lower, but we have seen quite a decent uh, sell off there in that stock. Yeah, can't really find a floor no. uh, on that one. And I guess you know, as we continue to look at the zero COVID strategy, which we'll talk about, of course, with our guests later on. Yeah. Uh, stocks like that will continue to really come under pressure, as analysts have pointed out. Two-year yield is dropping right now, two basis points, 2.9%, le lowest level since September. Some analyst ratings here. Yep, we got the likes of high tone Securities. Uh, that was cut to a hold at Hua Tai Research, a Goshone high-tech company as well. That was cut to a hold in China Communications Construction. Mm -hmm. uh, there you go, eight shares raised to a buy at DBS. Okay, the agenda, everything from Kaiser, we talked about that in sector-wise, of course, with lower yields, we might see, and hopefully that sort of engenders conditions here for maybe a floor around internet updates, of course, in the virus situation there in terms of data. The current account is due out, plus some forex reserves out of Hong Kong. Uh, the approach to the open is mild, tepid, and moderate, as with the weather in Shanghai this morning. The open there and here in Hong Kong, just ahead, this is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone, from the Asia Pacific, just 40 seconds away from the open of your cash markets on a mainland and here in Hong Kong. Futures are pointing down. We're mixed across Asia. U.S. futures have also turned slightly lower on the back of that rally, of course, that we had uh, overnight. That's really the story in equity markets. But, Yvonne, it's really in bond and bond yields and short data debt. That's really taken a massive turn lower this yeah. week following everything that we've heard from central banks. What a week, right? Yeah. If you're a bond trader, I'm guessing you, you have a bit of, quite a bit of a headache here after the BOE shocked the market and kept keeping rates <laughs> unchanged, that, that unreliable boyfriend term <laughs> coming back uh, to the BOE once again. And then you have all these central banks pushing against the market pricing here when it comes to, to the likelihood of raising interest rates. So we thought that this was going to be a big week in terms of a change and a milestone. And, in monetary policy, but it seems like at this point the doves kind of win, right? Uh, I mean, markets overshoot. 
Yeah. Uh, and uh, at this point, I guess central banks needed to step in, whether they talked to each other and then stepped in all together is, 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 I guess, for another conversation. Does it really matter when you look at where the two-year yield, of course, is in Australia? Have a look at some of the sector groups across the mainland. Here we go, some declines here um, at the open. When you look at Hong Kong, let's have a look at the benchmark here. Uh, because when yields were pushing lower, that does maybe set the floor uh, for HS Tech, which really hasn't really uh, yet to find its footing in terms of momentum moving forward. A couple of stocks we're tracking. As we mentioned, tech, we're looking at declines. Pretty sharp declines, I should note. Uh, your four heaviest weighted stocks on the Hang Seng Index. And we're looking at property. We're looking at Lenovo was out with earnings yesterday. Some of your oil plays on the back of what OPEC did, of course. And some of your uh, COVID-related stocks like Hot Pot, Heidi Lau, and Longy Green, of course, has, been, has had a terrible week at at least both there. We're down about 3%. Uh, on that stock today, Yvonne. All right, uh, so get to the latest out with uh, President Xi Jinping uh, in his latest speech so saying China is open to discussing key points of its trade tensions with the U.S., including subsidies to industrial firms and state-owned companies. Speaking at the opening of the China International Import Expo in Shanghai, he promised an active and open attitude to talks. Joining us now with details of Bloomberg's Greater China Executive Editor, John Liu. Uh, John... Would you say this is a sign of, of things thawing between the U.S. and China when it comes to trade? Uh, I think everyone heard these comments from President Xi last night and thought, is this some sort of signal for, for the U.S.? Because obviously everyone's looking forward to this virtual summit between Presidents Biden and Xi. Uh, that's probably going to happen in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and, of course, industrial subsidies, the role of state-owned enterprises in China's economy. That's been two of the prickliest issues between the two countries. Uh, does this signal some sort of a more dovish approach from Beijing heading into that meeting? It's hard to say. Uh, I think complicating this matter is the fact that uh, lots of other contingencies are interested in the same issue. So you have China trying to join the, the, what the trade deal formerly known as TPP and, and needing to address industrial subsidies and SOEs just the same. And the Europeans have been uh, uh, upset about some of these practices as well. So she, in the speech, potentially could have been addressing lots of different audiences. How does this all set up for potential talks with Joe Biden? I think uh, if I'm in the U.S. today, this gives me some optimism that, uh, that China is willing to discuss. Maybe there's some room to move and some room to, to come to an agreement. Uh, of course, uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, it's, a lot easier, it's a lot easier to say that China is ready and open to discuss these things than it is to actually come to the table and get something done. Hmm. Okay, John Liu, our Greater China Executive Editor there, live for us out of Beijing on some promising, fairly encouraging developments then on the back of the speech out of President Xi Jinping. Yeah. Right, now let's uh, take a look at uh, one stress, uh, fairly uh, part of the market that's coming under a lot of stress here. We're talking about junk debt. Uh, and, you know, in terms of just compared to where you are right now to fair value and, you know, where you are supposedly on par, $37 billion uh, is that gap right now. And so far, there's little signs of the sell of abating here. Nakaisa announced that it was suspending trade in Hong Kong today. But even before today, bonds and shares uh, tumbled. I think we're below 50 cents in the December 7 bond that's maturing, I believe, there. And of course, we're at record lows here on the shares itself here in, in Hong Kong. Yeah, for the latest, let's bring in our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, in Hong Kong. Uh, more issues for Kaiza, more yep. angst for the property sector. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Kaiza back in the news, obviously, after that big debt restructuring in 2016. Look, this is the, th among the developers, this is the third largest uh, issuer of dollar bonds among the developers, okay? So this is not necessarily a cynic or a Sunak. This is getting upwards in the territory of Evergrande. Not nearly as many liabilities, obviously, as Evergrande, or not nearly as the size and scope of their developments uh, and uh, what they need to potentially pay back. But again, Kaisa sending uh, this, you know, shockwaves through uh, that bond market that David just talked about. Uh, they missed their payments on principal and interest on these wealth management products, which are onshore mm. as well. So there's, there's all kinds of concerns about their liquidity situation. And they did put a statement out to the market saying the company has faced unprecedented pressures on its liquidity. And again, it cited or, you know, we all know the the, the many of the reasons, the unfavorable factors such as the credit ratings downgrades in the sector and also this uh, challenging property market environment that a lot of these developers, most of these smaller mid tier uh, developers are facing. So as you rightfully said, David, we have Kaisa Group, Kaisa Capital Investment, Kaisa uh, Health uh, and Kaisa Property all suspended in Hong Kong today. No reason given, but I, I think mm. I just outlined a lot of the reasons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, we can, we, I mean, we can, we can 
we can fancy an educated guess, really, perhaps why yeah. uh, why they've halted trade. Uh, the latest in Evergrande, and what, what do we understand about, I guess, creditors and interest and stakeholders looking and at yachts and yachts, <laughs> yachts and houses so, and property? Yeah, th there's that big yacht, uh, I think it's a $45 million yacht that is in focus right now. Mm -hmm. It's moored here in Hong Kong off the, is it the, the Gold Yacht Coast? Club? The, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of assets. So it's the finding the paper trail and the electronic trail of his wealth because he holds a lot of his shares with his wife through a BVI, British Virgin Islands company. Uh, so it's a bit opaque uh, in tracking his funds as bondholders. Okay, yeah, the first bond coupons were paid uh, after their 30-day grace period, but there's so many liabilities coming due. Uh, will they continue to have the liquidity situation to be able to pay their bondholders? And as we've seen, uh, dollar bondholders have been lower on the pecking order as far as getting uh, their payments. Uh, now, as far as their assets, many of them are tied up in very intricate uh, web of companies and affiliates. Like I said, he has his holdings uh, with his wife in the British Virgin Islands BVI mm -hmm. company. Uh, but we do know that he received more than $7 billion in dividends since Evergrande went public back in 2009. Uh, he has deployed about $3.3 billion to buy company shares. Uh, he has, you know, bonds, also those luxury assets that you talked about. Not only the $45 million U.S. dollar yacht, which I would think would be you know, first on the chopping block and the, the, on the sale block, and somebody's going to get it fairly, I put air quotes, cheap, $45 million. But he has luxury homes. He has two homes that we know of up on the peak worth a combined $200 million U.S. dollars. Uh, business jets, he has at least three business jets, a combined value of $236 million. It's nothing compared to the $300 billion in outstanding liabilities. But again, you know, those creditors who need are seeking ways to find payment, and the government has already indicated that it wants uh, Mr. Hui to dip into his personal fortune. They're finding the paper trail and the electronic trail to find where exactly he's, they're going to be able to get that. And how much wealth he does have, right? Uh, yeah. It's, it's kind of hidden. Yeah. All right. Stephen Engel there with the latest on all things property. I uh, just want to bring you these latest lines uh, according to the Dow Jones uh, when it comes to Boeing. Oh. Uh, the current and former directors of the, of the airline have reached, or the playmaker, I should say, have reached an approximately $225 million agreement to settle a shareholder lawsuit that claimed that Boeing's uh, board failed to properly oversee safety matters related to the 737 Max. Uh, as part of this settlement, we're hearing from the Dow Jones that Boeing has agreed to hire an ombudsman uh, to handle these internal issues. Yeah, and the settlement could be filed as soon as Friday. And as everyone is pointing out, that's according, of course, to Dow Jones. Okay, let's get it over now to Vonnie Quinn. She's in New York, and she has your first word news. Vonnie. David, thank you. The Bank of England defied market expectations by keeping interest rates on hold, putting its credibility potentially on the line as it chooses to prioritise risks to economic growth over potential inflation. Officials led by Governor Andrew Bailey voted 7-2 to two to keep the benchmark rate at a record low 10 basis points. Traders slashed rate hike bets and sent the pound tumbling with a five-year gilt yield set for the biggest decline since the Brexit vote. SEC filings show the U.S. markets regulator has rejected plans for at least two Bitcoin derivatives-based funds. Direction and Valkyrie both withdrew applications for ETFs late last month at the SEC's request. The first U.S. Bitcoin ETFs launched in October, nearly a decade after the first applications were filed. However, it seems regulators are not yet ready to greenlight more complex derivatives-based funds. Going back two years now, um, two and a half years, I, I have urged us to rethink our approach to spot Bitcoin exchange traded products. I think that um, the standard that we apply has been different than the standard we've applied to similar products. So I don't know whether that will change, but my guess is that um, given Chair Gensler has, has signaled pretty strongly that he, he likes to see these products trade in regulated markets, um, that, that may be something that's standing in the way of, of approval. New York City Mayor-elect Eric Adams says he'd like to take his first three paychecks in Bitcoin when he takes office in January. Adams told Bloomberg this week he wanted to turn New York into a crypto-friendly city and a hub for growth and innovation. He also said he's looking to set up a so-called Citicoin cryptocurrency, similar to one recently launched by Miami. Scientists have identified a gene that doubles the risk of respiratory failure from COVID-19. 
University of Oxford researchers found a higher risk version of the gene most likely prevents the airways and lungs from responding properly to the virus. About 60% of people with South Asian ancestry carry this version of the gene. That compares with 15% of people with European heritage. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Vani Quinn, this is Bloomberg. Yvonne. Well, coming up next, as the rest of the world opens up, can China hold up with its COVID-0 strategy for much longer? We're going to ask Christina Ramirez, professor of biostatistics at UCLA. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the show. You're watching Bloomberg Markets. China opened just 12 minutes into the session. We're looking at declines just about across the board here on these benchmarks. We're also looking at this virus story that's yet again emerged. And, of course, with China, in China's case here, the world's last holdout for COVID-0. But this really hasn't sparked the same sort of investor interest in stocks geared towards I guess, lockdown living as they <laughs> as they did last year, Yvonne. Yeah, if you take a look at this chart, though, you are seeing when it comes to, you know, the benefits of COVID-0, it seems like things are looking uh, a little bit more thin now and that you're not really going to see that much benefit to kind of curbing these, uh, you know, adding restrictions, you're locking down Disneyland, you know, is that really going to help? Right. Uh, now that you see growth, seeing considerable downward pressures mm -hmm. now, for more insights, we're joined by Christina Ramirez, professor of biostatistics at UCLA. Uh, professor Ramirez, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I, the key question, I guess, is that as China gets a little bit more isolated, how sustainable is this COVID-0 strategy? Well, it, let me say it's really hard. Respiratory viruses are notoriously difficult, uh, difficult to contain. And it seems like with Delta, it's even more so. It seems like we have a really high viral load, uh, much more so than we saw with Alpha and uh, pre-Alpha um, pre strains. And so it also seems that we're getting higher peak viral load before people are getting symptoms. This means that it is easier to spread. And indeed, we are seeing that in the data. And so the zero COVID strategy is going to be very difficult. So uh, China just built uh, new quarantine centers for travelers. Um, so they have two new ones. So I suspect they're going to try to keep the strategy, but it's going to be very difficult, especially because Delta is so dominant. Hmm. So what would be the adjustment that, that, that China needs to make then? Well, um, uh, that, that's an excellent question. So if they're going to stick with zero COVID, then they're going to have to wait for the rest of the world to become vaccinated. Uh, so right now we're looking at about maybe 40% of the world is fully vaccinated because um, especially with Delta and who knows what other variants uh, may come along, which may be even more infectious, it really only takes one sort of miss. Um, where a, an infected person sneaks through and spreads to other people, and then it, it, it spreads like wildfire. And so it's going to be more and more difficult as, as time goes on. And so maybe they're hoping that the rest of the world will become vaccinated and, um, and COVID will go away, but we're really looking at co um, COVID as an endemic virus. So it's gonna become more and more difficult to keep the zero uh, COVID policy. Um, and the fact that they're still quarantining vac fully vaccinated people, what does that tell you about the efficacy uh, of vaccines at the moment? So um, the Sinovac and the other um, uh, Sinopharm seem to have lesser efficacy than the Western vaccines. And there's been at least one study showing that uh, you get antibody waning um, um, and actually having in every 40 days. But we're also seeing that in other uh, vaccines, uh, in many different countries that we're seeing that the efficacy against infection uh, seems to be waning. But I must say that the efficacy against hospitalization and uh, death still seems to be very strong. But we are seeing uh, waning protection from infections. And we're seeing that while they're very good at preventing hospitalization and death, they are not stopping spread. There was a paper just in Lancet Infectious Disease that was showing transmission in households 
and it was very similar between fully vaccinated uh, cases and unvaccinated uh, cases. When the index case, the person who was infected, was fully vaccinated. So what it's really telling us is the vaccines can prevent hospitalization and death, but they're less effective at preventing transmission and spread. Hmm. And, you know, we're, we're seeing that to your, to your last point there, Christina, we're seeing that in places like Singapore, for example, which has abandoned, yeah. of course, COVID zero strategy, and you're seeing the number of cases move up. And this paradigm shift of measuring simply cases uh, to hospitalizations. I mean, we never, uh, uh, I get a good example is we, we, we never report, oh, the people having migraines today are at XXX because it's, it's, it's simply that naturally uh, just happens. How would you then suggest we measure success for places that have moved away from COVID zero and are seeing cases spike? I'd actually really like to see good data on COVID hospitalizations and COVID related deaths. So not just people who um, subsequently test for COVID in the hospital, but people who were hospitalized uh, with COVID and broken down by their immune status. You know, were they um, fully vaccinated and they're experiencing a breakthrough infection? Are they unvaccinated? Are they recovered from COVID? Yeah. Are they recovered from COVID and vaccinated? I know the Israelis are keeping um, track of this data, but I think worldwide we should be keeping track of hospitalizations and serious cases, because that really will tell us um, how we're doing. And the latest news was the UK uh, approving the first at-home treatment of COVID with this Merck pill. How has that changed the fight uh, for Delta and COVID now? Mm. Does it actually fill a gap that vaccines perhaps can't? Mm. Absolutely. So um, we like we were like I was just saying that we see really rapid uh, viremia early on, and so it really seems that early treatment can be a um, a real um, real key to keeping people from getting really sick and uh, and dying uh, should they become infected. Because we know while the vaccines are great and they do prevent a lot of hospitalization and death, people who are immunocompromised and people who are elderly and more frail are much more likely to have a breakthrough case. And for uh, for these people, especially, this can really save their life. Christina, thank you so much. Have a great thank rest you. of your evening and, and late afternoon there, of course, at UCLA Fielding School of, of Public Health. Christina Ramirez, they're joining us there. Right, uh, there's plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Well, Airbnb reported record sales and earnings beating estimates, even as Delta triggered restrictions around the world. We heard from the CEO, Brian Chesky, earlier on. Well, what we saw with the pandemic was a massive acceleration. It's now 20% of our business are nights that are longer than a month. Nearly 50% of our business are for nights longer than a week. And I think the lesson here is the longer you're away from home, the more you want to be in a home. And increasingly, people are going to want this flexibility. So answer your question, Emily, I think it's going to be a lot larger than 20%. I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's pretty clear where the world's going. Still, you know, you've got Australia. It's been closed to international tourists until just about now. Hong Kong has these lengthy quarantines. Thailand uh, still grappling with outbreaks. Singapore stopping and starting. What's been the impact of these delayed reopenings, especially in the Asia Pacific region? Well, I mean, like North America and Europe are, um, Latin America are outpacing APAC. But what we've seen is that, you know, just to give you a point of reference, before the pandemic, half of our business was cross-border. And in fact, the majority of our business were people crossing borders or staying in cities. What we've seen is that the biggest growth we've seen is people not crossing borders, traveling domestically, and not traveling to cities, going to vacation destinations or rural communities. What we've now seen, though, is that as borders start to get reopened, growth cross-border surges. When President Biden announced on, on October uh, 15th that borders were reopened on, on November 8th, the week after, within one week of that announcement, cross-border bookings into the United States were up 44% in one week. So 
Obviously, we're um, borders still closed, cross borders still restricted, but that also means that we think there's going to be a lot of pent up demand. And so, the longer the borders remain closed, the more pent up demand there is after. And I think travel is one of the things that people miss the most that they felt like has been taken away from them, especially cross border travel. So, I think you're going to see a lot more once the borders reopen. So, let's talk about after then. How do you see the mix of domestic and cross border travel shifting as we move forward? I mean, it will, it will, it will, it will re, it will come back a bit. I don't think you're ever going to see the world looking like 2019. Business travel will come back, but business travel will never come back to 2019 levels, at least in the way it was. People getting on airplanes for a meeting. Uh, now you can do it on Zoom. It's much cheaper. There will be new types of business travel, which I think could make up the gap, which are people who are working remotely flying or going back to headquarters for weeks at a time. So there's a major shift from business to leisure. There's a major shift from people going to the top destinations, the people traveling everywhere. And no matter how travel recovers, I think the genie's out of the bottle. I think increasingly more and more people are going to travel nearby. They're going to stay longer and they're going to travel in off peak hours. But when we do see borders reopen and when we do see urban come back, it's going to be a rebalance. I don't think it ever goes back to 2019, but it will be somewhere in between. Hard to know exactly where. So let's talk about holiday travel, Thanksgiving right around the corner. What are you expecting? And are you prepared if there is another wave of COVID uh, or new variant that takes off around the globe? I think it's going to be a really big holiday season, obviously. I think most people in travel are saying that um, because I think, you know, not everything from the pandemic that we lost, we all probably want to get back. I don't know if everyone, for example, wants to go back to the office five days a week if they don't have to. But I do think you know, most people want to travel because travel is one of the most meaningful ways to spend time with people you care about. So I think that that is absolutely um, important. Now, I also would say this about what if there's another variant? You know, I think anyone who was in the business of predicting the future last year was humbled. And so the best thing I can say is if I can't predict the future, I can't adapt to it. And Airbnb's business model is highly adaptable. We have nearly every type of home um, with uh, in nearly every type of community at nearly every price point for every type of trip. And so that means however travel changes, our model can adapt. So I'm very optimistic in adaptability of our model. It's because we have such a global network. However it changes, we'll be prepared. And that was Brian Chesky of Airbnb speaking with our Emily Chang. Okay, let's uh, just a brief look across these markets. And we have turned quite red, in fact, uh, across these Chinese equity markets. And obviously with the benchmark, with the reopening and the pull you're getting there across that. So just sector groups as far as today is concerned. There we go. Uh, largely down and uh, just across section look across asset classes here with equities, as we mentioned, under pressure. We'll talk more about what's happening in the bond markets and oil. A bit later on, this is Bloomberg.